Welcome back to our series, We Want to See Jesus. And now we turn the corner into the season of Advent as we get closer to Jesus coming, as we get towards the later years of the Old Testament, um, which the video kind of showed um, how many times that promise was fulfilled and how God keep telling his people and keep giving them more inform giving them more information. And yet, how dead and decaying it seemed, the line of kings, the line of people, the, the nation, and how far they had gotten away. And now uh, we've worked our way up to the promise about a new branch, a new growth, a new life that would come out of that, the righteous branch that, that Isaiah talked about, Zechariah talked about, Jeremiah. We're going to be focusing on how Jeremiah talked about that and how that is showing us Jesus. But first this, in 1992, an armed robber named Dennis Lee Curtis was arrested in Rapid City, South Dakota for armed robbery. But Dennis Lee apparently had some scruples about his thievery because in his wallet, uh, the police found a folded up piece of paper on which um, Dennis Lee had written the following code of, code of honor. Number one, I will not kill anyone unless I have to. Number two, I will take cash and food stamps, no checks. Number three, I will rob only at night. Number four, I will not wear a mask. Number five, I will not rob mini marts or 7-Eleven stores. Six, if I get chased by cops on foot, I will get away. If chased by vehicle, I will not put the lives of innocent civilians on the line. Seven, I will rob only seven months out of the year. And eight, I will enjoy robbing from the rich to give to the poor. This thief had a sense of morality, but it was flawed, wasn't it? Because later on, when he stood before the court, he wasn't, he wasn't judged by the standards that he had set for himself, but he was judged by the higher law of the state. And the same thing is true for us. When, when we stand before God, we're not going to be judged by the code of morality or the standards that we set for ourselves. We're going to be judged by God's perfect law. We're going to be judged by what's right in, in God's eyes. And so... What's right in our eyes isn't always what's right in God's eyes. The codes of morality, the standards that we set for ourselves, the way we justify our behavior, the, the excuses we make for kind of our shortcomings and failures or the way we live or the way we want to live aren't always the same as what God's perfect code of morality and standards are, which are perfect and best for us. And so those two things are so often at odds, and they've been throughout history. Adam and Eve made their own code, too, their own code of morality. We want to be like God. We want to know good and evil. We don't want God to be holding out on us. So they made their own code of morality about how they were going to make decisions, but that their justification didn't hold up. And they lost the righteousness that they had before God. And because they did, so did we. But God, who loves us, promised then and there that he would send someone to, to give us that righteousness back. And so then through history, God creates this, he forms this family, this nation of people. This, he, he plants this tree. He, he makes this living promise that, that from this family, from this tree is going to come this person. And from this nation of people is going to come the one who would fulfill the promise that God made. And, and then God gave them a way to live. Out of thanks, this, this family, this nation of people who are, going to, who are going to bring that person who's going to change everything and redeem everything into the world, out, they were to joyfully live according to the, this perfect law that that God had given them. But they wanted to follow their own code of morality as well. 
They also wanted to follow their own code of morality. Uh, they, they, they followed other gods. They lived the way they wanted to live. They did what was right in their eyes. And so God sent a prophet named Jeremiah to warn them. You see, the people of Judah had forsaken God and run after other gods. The, the, the two kingdoms had split apart. The northern kingdom of Israel already had split off from God, and they already had been carried off by Assyria. And now the southern nation of Judah that was doing a little bit better had forsaken God and run after other gods. And here's the problem, like I was talking with the kids, it was their rulers who was leading them to do it. The ones who were supposed to take, the ones that God entrusted to take care of his flock were not shepherding them at all. And so as a judgment, as a consequence, as a discipline, God was sending Babylon to come and take them captive and carry them for a while into captivity in Babylon. And so, so Jeremiah, speaking for God, tells King Zedekiah, just, hey, this is from God. So he tells Zedekiah to surrender, but Zedekiah doesn't want to hear any of that. He doesn't listen. And so then Jeremiah speaks these words our, of our text um, against these shepherds, these leaders of God's people, the ones who are supposed to take care of them. So our text is going to be the first six verses from Jeremiah 23. Here's the first two verses. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you've done, declares the Lord. So who were these shepherds who were destroying and scattering God's people? It was, it was the kings of Judah. It's not quite how it works in our nation, but in this nation, these kings were also supposed to be the spiritual leaders of the people. The king's number one job and number one priority was leading people to love and follow God. But they were doing the opposite. They were leading them to other gods. And by introducing idolatry, they were, they were implementing and introducing and promoting and encouraging ungodliness and immorality and a life walking away from God instead of walking with him and toward him. They were introducing their own code, what was right in their eyes. And so what was happening, the people weren't being fed with God's word. They weren't being strengthened. They weren't being taken care of, and they were being scattered. Like, imagine sheep not having a shepherd. Imagine kids without a babysitter. They were being scattered into all kinds of danger, into idols and false worship and things that, that can't deliver and things that can't give us what we need. And, and the practices of the unbelieving neighbors became their own. Would we know anything about that? Would we know anything about what it's like for the practices of the world that doesn't follow God around us to start becoming our own? If, if we're not receiving guidance, if we're not being fed with the word, if we're not being centered on who God is and who his son is and who um, the life that he truly wants for us, it, it's not hard, right, to sort of start drifting into what looks pretty nice. This is what they were constantly doing getting involved in these other gods, these other religions, these other lifestyles, these other philosophies that seemed great. And so we live in a world that surrounds us with all kinds of things that promises all kinds of fulfillment and happiness and joy, all of which fail all the time. And that is what's happening to the people. They're being scattered. And I think we know how that works. I think we know how it works to kind of just start adopting the practices of people around us who don't know God and who wouldn't have our eternal well-being in mind. If the leaders we look to for spiritual formation aren't directing us to the Word of God, which is what we need, then we are just wandering and we're being scattered looking for fulfillment and purpose and all the things that are important in all the other things of the world which are only and always and ever going to leave us confused and wanting and not satisfied. Because the things of the world could never satisfy us like the one thing we need, that relationship with God. 
So God says to these shepherds, because you have not attended to their needs, I'm going to be attending to your needs. It's kind of neat how he puts it in the, in the Hebrew. He's, he's really getting into their faces here. You haven't attended to them, I'm going to attend to you all right. And he's, going to, he's then going to talk about this punishment. He's, they're going to be carried off into captivity for a time to show them how important this is and to show them what it's really going to be like. You want a life without God? I'm going to show you what that's like for 70 years. Why? Because they had turned away from God. Because they were acting like, well, they were acting like a lot of people act today. Fickle. Following God when it suits you, and then, and then not following God. You know, following God when it's handy to, and then not following God. Doing, you know, like, what works for me or what feels comfortable, but the moment it stops feeling comfortable, I'm just going to pull back. Right? In and out. They, were, they would follow God for a while and then not follow God for a while. They would follow God for a few years and then follow other gods for a few years. And, and it depended who was on the throne. It always depended who was on the throne. Whoever was ruling on the throne would determine whether or not they were following God or not. So when, when you had an evil king, like we talked last week about Manasseh, super evil king, when you had an evil king ruling, that's what the nation of people did. The whole nation kind of got into the sin that Manasseh was leading them into. All kinds of other stuff. That was super harmful for them. They were sacrificing their children to gods. But then when a good king like Josiah, who found the Bible in the temple, like when, the, when a good king like that would start ruling, then the people start coming back to God. So the leader who was supposed to be their shepherd and leading them always made a big difference. The, the, a nation would follow. And so the leader that we let that we put in that position in our life is super important. We see what, it, what an impact it had on their lives. So that's our second point. Your relationship with God is related to the ruler of your life. Your relationship with God is directly related to the ruler that you, that you have established on the throne of your life. See, God was addressing He's addressing the leaders in these verses, but, but the people weren't without guilt either, and, and neither are we, because we allow people to sit on the throne of our, of our heart and life. So who do we let sit on the throne of our heart? Who, who, who leads us in this world? We've seen the difficulty in the scriptures, and we've probably seen it in our lives, um, that comes when the one leading you isn't leading you to God, and ultimately is leading you to things that don't last or that aren't actually that helpful. If, if the leader that I'm listening to isn't pointing me to Jesus, but to financial security, or to, to just my emotional needs, or my physical health, or my sexual fulfillment, or my earthly success, or whatever it is that doesn't last, then I'm not being cared for. Whoever I'm going to look to as a leader, whoever I'm going to uh, let mentor me, needs to be mentored themselves by Jesus, needs to be pointing me to Jesus, because that ultimately is where every answer we need comes from, from Jesus. God is the leader that we need. Look what he's going to do. Here's the next couple verses from our text. And the Lord is saying, I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture and will and they will be where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. So this promise is going to be fulfilled in two ways. First of all, God was going to bring back a remnant of those people that were carried off into captivity back to their homeland. And there he's going to place over them shepherds who would feed them with God's word, so they no longer had to be afraid of their circumstances or afraid of consequences. And secondly, God isn't going to let his people remain scattered. And that includes us. We, we have a shepherd God. We have a shepherd king God. We have a shepherd uh, God who, who always is looking to gather us to himself, where he knows life is best, where he knows that's the way it should be. And God is going to bring all the people who follow Jesus, all of his flock, back to his pasture where we will be safe. The remnant being spoken of here and being pointed to is everyone, everyone who has ever believed in Jesus from every nation, from every people. And the shepherds who feed them 
The shepherds who feed them will be, as it says in Ephesians 4, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And those shepherds that feed God's people are being faithful when they're warning people against error, against the things that are harmful and dangerous for them, and when they are comforting people with the good news of forgiveness that's found in Jesus. Then Jeremiah shares this awesome promise. Verse 5, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. So all of a sudden, in the middle of this sort of... um, prophecy where, where, where the leaders are being chided a bit and corrected a bit, all of a sudden this beautiful promise comes of what God is going to do and who he's going to bring. Now, in, in going back farther, in 2 Samuel 7, 12, we heard God tell King David, God says this, when your days are over, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Not just a few years like Solomon was going to, you know, David's son, but your kingdom forever. So God is pointing to something longer lasting here. And then the prophet Isaiah repeats it from chapter 11. Isaiah says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Jesse was David's father. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From its roots, a branch will bear fruit. So this dead tree, there's going to be a branch that bears fruit. And then uh, in in chapter 4, Isaiah writes, in that day the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious. And then the prophet Zechariah, the Lord tells Zechariah, I'm going to bring my servant the branch. And in chapter 6, he says to Zechariah, here is the man whose name is the branch, and he will branch out from this place and build the temple of the Lord. We want to see Jesus. Here he is. This is a promise of Jesus. Jesus is the branch. Now, the, the Hebrew word for branch, uh, tzema, means a new shoot or growth. Because when I normally think of a branch, I think of like a big, thick, you know, branch with bark on it and stuff like that. This is not a big, bark-covered branch that's growing out of the side of the tree. This word for branch, is a, it's, like a, it's like a new shoot or growth that's growing out of a a dying stump or growing out of the ground where where a tree has just recently been decaying. So it's this fresh new growth with its own strength and life. True, it's coming from that dead and decaying tree, but it is in itself something new and independent with life coming out of death. Jesus. Jesus is that new shoot. Jesus is that new branch of David. David, David, who was this man after God's own heart, and then who after him all his sons and their sons and the grandsons and all that line, had the, the, the succession of kings and sons who followed him um, had become decayed and lifeless like a dead stump. They had lost their connection with God. But here Jeremiah is giving us hope because Out of that death and decay and hopelessness, out of that, a a new shoot is coming. A new branch is coming. The the seed that was promised Adam and Eve, it's coming. The seed is coming. This new shoot, this new growth, this branch, this the king is coming. Jesus is coming. Even though what we see in all those wicked kings was hopeless, the promise is still alive. Okay, new life is coming with with Jesus, who, who is righteous, and who reigns wisely, not like these current shepherds of the day. So then the Hebrew word for shepherding a flock can also be translated as to rule or govern, especially when it's used in connection with a king. So a good king is not someone who who rules over people for his own benefit. A good king is someone who, who takes care of his people, looks out for their interests, and rules over them for their benefit. And isn't that why David was such a good king? Because think of how David was raised. He wasn't a career politician or anything like that. Uh, His father wasn't a king. David grew up in a field, 
shepherd, learning how to be a shepherd and taking care of sheep. And David was willing to risk his life to protect those sheep, even if it meant going to battle against a bear or a lion. And when David then became a king, he took that same shepherd heart with him. And so he cared for his people physically in battle, but also spiritually by leading them to follow God, the the God that he failed and then repented and came back to. David was imperfect. He failed time and time again, but he repented because his heart always belonged to God, even though he fell as awful and bad as we do. And so spiritually, he led his people to serve the true God. Jesus is the ruler that we need on the throne of our hearts. Because like David, Jesus was a shepherd king. Uh, Mark 6 says this, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Jesus taught them. Jesus encouraged them. Jesus served them. Jesus died for them. Jesus trained his disciples. He empowered them to go out in his name. He took care of them. And from his throne in heaven, Jesus is still our shepherd king today. He he watches over us and cares for us. He provides pastors and teachers and mentors to feed us, to shepherd his people. He watches over his flock. In times of temptation, he stands between us and Satan. In times of weakness, he carries us. In times of death, he gathers us to heaven. Jesus is our shepherd king. Then verse 6. In his days, and this is being written 700 years before Jesus is born. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. The Lord, our righteous savior. So God spoke this judgment to rulers who were leading his people astray. They, God's people weren't being cared for, and, and the shepherds were to blame. So when Jeremiah delivered this message, the, um, the final king of Judah was King Zedekiah. He would be the final king that Judah would ever have. He was the shepherd. He was the shepherd being spoken of. And so Judah was going to be taken into captivity in Babylon, and um, So Jeremiah then prophesied that this was God's will and and that the the people of Judah um, should just accept God's plan of punishment and restoration and and submit to Babylon and just surrender and and go through this. But Zedekiah wanted none of that. Zedekiah had other plans. So Zedekiah rebels against Nebuchadnezzar. He rebels against the king of Babylon. It didn't go so well for Zedekiah. And so the the city of Jerusalem was surrounded by the Babylonian army, put it under siege. Zedekiah tries escaping in the middle of the night, but he's captured by Babylonian troops who then execute his sons in front of his eyes and then gouge his eyes out. Zedekiah. Zedekiah, whose name meant, the Lord is my righteousness. Kind of ironic, huh? Because in so many ways, the Lord was not Zedekiah's righteousness. And Zedekiah was far from righteous. He didn't listen to God. He allowed idol worship. He didn't lead, he didn't lead people to God. He, le- he led people away from God. He was unjust, unethical, unfair, unkind. He was righteous in his own eyes. He had his own moral standard, like the thief in Rapid City like you and me, who often make our own moral standard and live by those instead of God's. But righteousness is what God wants from us. A a rightness with God and others, a straightness with God and others. Zedekiah didn't have either. So God says, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise up a new king, a wise king, a a righteous king. And he will save the people and he will be righteous. In fact, this is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our 
righteousness. So not only would he be righteous, he would be our righteousness. Jesus lived a, a, a perfect life of righteousness in our place, and then he, he died to, to pay for our sins, and God accepted that as the full payment for the sins of the world, and he declared the whole world righteous for Jesus' sake. So he took our sins, he gave us his righteousness, righteousness that we could never have gotten on our own. And so Jesus is our righteousness. Just look at that little three-letter word, our. Jesus didn't come here just to show us how righteous he was. He came here to be our righteousness. So what does that mean for you and me? When God asks you, did you keep my first commandment? Did you always put me first in your life? Did you honor me above every other thing? Did you think about me more than anything? Did, 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 was I first place in your heart and life? Did, did you love me more than everything else in this world? You can say, no, Lord, I didn't. I must confess my sins. I can't hide them from you anyway. But Jesus did. He always honored you perfectly, always. Even when he was dying on the cross, because you had to forsake him, he still honored you perfectly. And Lord, it says right here, it says right here that he did that for me. It says right here that he is, he's the Lord our righteousness. So did I keep the first commandment? Yes, I did. Jesus kept it for me. Friends, Jesus has brought us out of Babylon. He's brought us out of the land of slavery and bondage, and he's brought us in the land of Israel, the land of promise and blessing. We, we once were slaves, but now we're free in Jesus. We, we once were living without hope, without any future, but now we have the hope of eternal life. We once were like scattered sheep wandering about um, without a shepherd, lonely, afraid, lost, in trouble, in danger. But now the Lord, our righteousness, has brought us safely into his flock, into his fold. Now we have brothers and sisters in Christ who can watch out for one another. We're protected and we're guided by his hand. And we fear nothing, not even death. Because he's promised to always be with us. And when God looks on us now, he sees, he sees Jesus' life as it, if it had been our life. He sees our life as it had been Jesus' life. He doesn't see the sin. He doesn't see our disobedience. He sees people who have been forgiven of their sin. He sees people who are living in obedience to his will. And so he accepts us. He blesses us. And he, re he rewards us as if all that Jesus did had been done by us. his believing people. And that's why the Lord is our righteousness. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for, in our life, in our world, where it seems hopeless, where everything is dead and decaying, you came to bring life, new hope, life out of death, a new beginning, a new start in every one of our lives. Thank you for giving us righteousness where we could never have it, where we, where we had none. Thank you for 
ruling us in wisdom and love, watching over us for our needs and what's really good for us, rather than thinking about your needs and leaving us to wander and stray. Thank you for truly being the shepherd we need, truly being the king we need, and giving us the righteousness we could never have. So help us live in a way that shows that now. Help us go out and, and be difference makers in the people around us because we are people who carry your righteousness and carry that new life in us now instead of hopelessness. We live in a world that needs hope. You've given it to us in your life. So help us be bringers of that hope and sharers of that hope to everyone we can. In Jesus' name, amen.